in the middle of the desert. So as I went back on the other side of this big rock we were on, uh, I heard it again. And this time, as soon as I heard it, I knew what it was. And it was coming from underneath us. And the moment I heard it, I knew. And I, it, was a, it was a mountain lion cub. We what? were standing on top of a mountain lion den. What? I don't know who you are, but welcome to the Irish Photography Podcast. Sit back, relax, and listen about cameras, gear, settings, stories, and all things photography. Join Darren on Ireland's Best Photography Podcast. Let's go. And you're very welcome to episode 133 of the Irish Photography Podcast. My name is Darren, I'm your host this evening, and I'm joined by two people whose work I've both equally admired for a long time, and I'm delighted to have them both on the podcast this evening. So, without further ado, welcome to the Irish Photography Podcast, Mike and Chris Perea. How are we doing, guys? Uh, doing fantastic. How are you doing, Darren? I'm great, great. Thanks very much for coming on. You know, I know we tried to get on yesterday, but it was Patrick's day of recording, and there was never really <laughs> going to be a chance of me being able to record efficiently on Patrick's day, but it wasn't my fault, it was my kids. But at least we're here anyway now, so we're recording. So I'm delighted okay. to have you both on. So, uh, Chris, how's things with you? Good to finally uh, talk to you. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Thanks for having us. Thanks very much for coming on. I suppose, you know, like I said, and I alluded to on the intro, I've admired both of your work for a long period of time. Mike, I've been looking at your work for a number of years, but even Chris, I've seen some phenomenal images now coming from you. And we'll talk about that during the uh, the podcast. We'll also talk about the video side of things as well, which I now know that you're even more involved in as well. But, you know, before we're going to continue on, just for our audience so they know who you guys are, in case they were living under a rock for the last 20 years or 10 years or five years or four years, who are the Pereas? So uh, my name is Mike and this is my wife Chris and we are landscape nature photographers and also YouTubers uh, based out of Arizona which is uh, US Southwest. Okay brilliant brilliant and you know Chris you're originally from uh, Switzerland I believe how did you guys meet? Yes that's correct I'm from Switzerland. Uh, that's actually a funny story we kind of got introduced by mutual friends and they were Thomas Eaton and Brendan Vanson. Okay. I went on a workshop with them back in 2018 and Mike saw me on their videos and he started chatting with me through Instagram and that's how we met. Laid on the old Mike Perea charm and that's all that I needed. <laughs> but I think that that's a fantastic story how you both met anyway because true photography but also the fact that you know Mike you went hang on who's this? I got to find mm -hmm. out more, you know, mm -hmm. so you, 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 tur you turned it on to up to 11 on, on, the, on the dial. So it obviously works. So congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, next thing you know, we're, uh, we've now been married for a little over a year. Wow. So yeah, wow. it's, <laughs> it's a fantastic yeah, story. I never, I never knew that. I thought that she had met her something that you might've been over in, 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 the, in, in Europe and you might've met Chris there. And I was like, okay, I wonder how they meet. So that's why I'd asked the question. <laughs> I never thought it was something like that. So that's a fascinating way for you guys to meet. And as you say, you know, the rest so far is history in the making. Exactly. So, so yeah. Far, yeah. Yep. yeah. Absolutely. So, and actually, you know, Mike, just a side note, a side question. How much do you actually love tacos? Oh man, tacos are tacos are life. If I could eat one food for the rest of my life, I think it would have to be tacos. But thinking about that, I would probably spend a significant time in the restroom. So maybe, maybe not, maybe not one food, but I, I do love tacos. Yeah, I had to ask you that because I know even on your bio, you know, you've got one of the things that you do love tacos. And I can say, you know what, I'm yeah. going to have to ask him. How much does he actually love? Because I'm I, I've been to the US a number of times and you know I've eaten all different types of food and such like that. But tacos to me wouldn't necessarily be something that I'd go, oh my god, yeah, I gotta go back to the US just for them. Because I, I imagine you can get a very good quality taco, you can get a medium quality taco, oh, and yes. then you can get absolute muck. And that's probably what I ate when I was traveling in the US. Yes, the US Southwest, specifically Arizona, California, New Mexico. Maybe even Texas. I will give Texas a little bit there, but you have to go to the right region and in the right location because tacos in other parts of the country just they don't don't add up for sure. Mm. You have to do it right. And don't go to Taco Bell. 
No, don't go to Taco <laughs> Bell. No. It's a scam. <laughs> it's a scam. Yeah, it's, it's a scam. <laughs> yeah, that's probably where I went wrong, you know, because when I first yeah. went over, I, I remember there was a movie years ago, um, Demolition Man, I think it was, and the only mm. restaurant uh, chain that survived was Taco Bell. And I was going, geez, that must be good. I must give them a go, you know. <laughs> and the, the, first of my, the first of my travel, I went to, uh, to Chicago and we were coming from Chicago to my wife. My, my wife is from Wisconsin. And we were driving mm -hmm. along the road and all of a sudden I saw a big sign for Taco Bell and I went, okay, yeah, got to go. Hang on. <laughs> Can we go to Taco Bell? Really? I went, yeah, 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 yeah. I got to go to Taco Bell. No. No, 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 that's a no, terrible no. idea. <laughs> terrible idea. So no, you've answered that one for me, so that's good, I suppose. You know, I'll, I'll know the next time that when, when I do visit the US, I have to travel down, down south to be able to get a good, good taco. Yep, hot weather and good tacos. That's what we got down here. And do you prefer the crispy or the soft? Crispy! Uh, yes, I would say crispy for sure. <laughs> crispy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> At least we got an agreement in that one as well. So that's a good <laughs> yeah, match right. too, yeah? <laughs> right. And tell me, I suppose, you know, how did you guys both get in, uh, started in photography? Maybe, Chris, if I come to you first on that, when did the photography journey start and how did it start for you? So I, even as a kid, I always loved art and painting and I would go through boxes of crayons. And when I got older as a teenager, I just uh, borrowed my mom's camera and every time we went on a trip to Spain or the south of France, I would just take all the pictures and it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. And then eventually, I think it was uh, back in 2008 that I got my first, I guess, professional camera. Mm -hmm. So a camera with an exchangeable lens. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, so much fun going out and photographing nature and, and all of that. And uh, eventually I got into people photography okay. and I started my own business as a portrait and wedding photographer. So I was doing that for a while and it was like I didn't progress a lot or that's, you know, how I felt. So I decided to go on a landscape photography workshop because okay. I'm a strong believer that when you're stuck at a point in your career, just do something that you're... Uh, you've never done before, get out mm -hmm. of your comfort zone and you will probably learn then, you know, with anything else that we do that you already feel comfortable. Love it. Yeah. So I went yeah. on a photography workshop in Switzerland and for me, landscape, it was always in my imagination, just boring trees, flat horizons, shooting everything with a wide angle lens. <laughs> and I discovered that it wasn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> I really yeah. enjoyed it. I, I learned a much about color and composition that then helped me with the people photography. And so I, you know, couldn't really just leave it behind. So I started doing more landscape photography in the last few years. And uh, that's what I do now. And, and actually a question for you on that then, when you talk about people photography, was it portraiture photography, street photography? Was it in a studio? So I did um, some studio work. But I wasn't really feeling it. It was very like a sterile mm -hmm. environment. So I did a lot of the, the portraits outside, more natural, okay. like engagements or couples, or then the weddings, which are most of the time during the summer in Switzerland. So most mm -hmm. of the time they're outside. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you also have that, um, you know, nice landscape of Switzerland. And For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I think the reason I asked that is because like, the, the, the difference between studio photography and outdoor photography is light, number one, because the mm -hmm. light in a studio is, as you say, sterile, it's always fixed, there's nothing changing. Whereas when you're outside in the outdoors, you are dealing with a dynamic light, which gives you a different fall of light every single time. So you can get a mm -hmm. different portrait shot. And that's why I think was interesting. Then, you know, the reason I asked it is because like moving or transitioning from a studio to go from controlled light where you control it, to go into the landscape to where you don't, that's a big step in itself. But if you enjoyed the whole aspect of being outdoors, then the natural progression there, I think, is, yeah, maybe turn your hand to something that's in the landscape, learn more in regards to that it's not just two-dimensional, it's not just flatness in a tree here and place a rock or whatever it may have been. So there is more, I think, and we'll touch on it as well, I think, as, you, as we talk more this evening, but the different types of photography that you can do and what draws you to certain types of photography too. So I think it was interesting, as you say there, you were doing it outdoors. It's kind of a natural progression then as well to photograph the landscape that sat behind 
this couple that you were taking the photographs from the wedding point of view as well. So yeah, that's very, Absolutely, very interesting. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And Mike, how about you? How did you start? So mine is essentially the opposite of Chris's. So she started off with crayons. I am just getting into crayons now. So, <laughs> but uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so for me, it's always been about just the adventure and the travel. I've done that my entire life, whether it's hiking outdoors or camping, fishing, hunting, all that stuff. And eventually I decided I wanted to buy a camera. And I really can't even tell you exactly why I decided to buy a camera, but I ordered a DSLR. I didn't know what a DSLR was at the time. So I just a lot of letters, of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of letters, right? So I, when I ordered it off of Amazon on its way here, I started Googling what a DSLR was. And then I started Googling Brilliant. how to shoot in manual and aperture you know, and I found uh, a guy by the name of Josh Cripps, who's a, a, a YouTuber, yeah. and uh, found a lot of his stuff. And then Thomas Heaton and Brendan Vanson, and started watching all their videos. And just, I mean, right away, I was absolutely obsessed with it. And I uh, never got into people photography. That's never been my thing. I was always just one way. It was landscape and nature mm-hmm. and, and, you know, some wildlife as well. So it's just a medium for me to get out and get outside and, and explore. That's really what it's always been about. Yeah, and you know what? I think from a landscape point of view as well, like there's so much diversity that we can photograph mm-hmm. in many, many different areas, but also in such a small area too. And I think that's what I love yes. about it. Um, you know, I've said many times in the podcast, like I'm a one trick pony. I just pigeonhole myself and say, I do landscape photography. That's it. And mm-hmm. over the years, my friends would ask me, like, I've, I'm the guy with the camera. So of course, yeah, if there's a christening happening or bring Darren, and I'm like, <laughs> no way, man. Mm-hmm. This is not happening. Like, it it <laughs> yeah. is not happening, you know. Yeah, um, exactly. And, and a couple of times I tried it and failed, mm-hmm. but I really yep. did try, you know. And then I kind of said, no, you know what? I couldn't do anything that's very, very important. Like, again, I've said before a number of times, but um, I could never do a wedding. I could never do somebody's wedding because the pressure, I think, would be too much to t- if I messed it up. Like, how could you get all those people back there again to get those photographs? And that to me isn't like, oh, no. Landscape. Yeah, it's a lot of pressure. <laughs> yeah, landscape. Stay there. The rock doesn't yeah, move. Exactly. The tree only moves a small bit because of the wind. I'm perfectly happy with that, you know, because yeah. I think it, for me as well, like it's interesting, you know, you say about getting out and in the outdoors because I was always uh, of the opinion that I got out a lot from a hiking, not even climbing, but just getting out and playing and being out in the area and being outdoors. But when you go out with the camera, it adds a whole different dimension to it as well, because yes, not absolutely. only are you seeing it with your eyes, but you're also trying to capture it with a camera, which effectively is a 2D sphere, as you say, Chris, but you're, it's a 3D world. So the challenge is trying to convert that into a 3D image of a 2D plane, let's just say. And that's, that's what yeah. I love about landscape. But then I also love as well, like even to bring the video camera and to record the video now as well, of going mm-hmm. to that place or what I might have seen or how I even picked up a photograph or picked up a composition and such like that. And I noticed, and you mentioned at the beginning there, you know, you have a very successful YouTube channel. And I, I've noticed in the last number of years, it's no longer Mike Perea's YouTube channel. So it's kind <laughs> of been taken over, you know. So uh-huh. it, it, it's uh-huh. both of you at this point in time. So maybe if I go to you on that, Mike, first, how did your YouTube channel start? And Chris, how did you take it over? <laughs> <laughs> So for me, it was, again, I go back to just being outside and the adventure. And that's kind of what the video started off as. We're just simply recording what I was doing, you know, hiking, uh, taking the photos. Like it was more of a behind the scenes of the photos. Eventually, it started turning into maybe adding some tips here and there. As I started to progress and learn things, I would try to pass that on to people that would watch the video. So it became kind of a split between... uh, like tutorials and just basic vlogs of me out shooting, you know, and, and that's kind of what we've doing a similar version of that now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, that's how it started. And that's, that's kind of what we really like doing is just being out outside and, and uh, just being in the landscape and recording that and filming that and telling that kind of story. Yeah. It's an awesome channel. I mean, I love watching your work Ah, anyway, you. you know, so, you know, and I suppose bringing on then to, like I say, Chris, how did you manage to take it over? Go on, spill hey, the I never wanted that. <laughs> <laughs> Might just stuck a, his film camera in my face and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was it was fun actually, especially learning a new medium like film. Mm. It was never like the moving picture, you know? Mm-hmm. Like telling a story with a video is something completely different than with a photo. I must say I, I really enjoy it. It's fun. 
Yes. It, if you think about it, though, the the photo is just kind of a vignette of the actual story. I mean, it, it can be a story in itself, but for me, the video helps tell the that entire story and, and give a little more context uh, instead of having just the the little vignette of the photo, which, like I said, can tell a, to- a story itself, but it's a uh, it helps, and I like it. It's a different art form a, and a different way to tell the story of the adventure and the landscape and nature. Yeah, I'm just waiting for the day that when video evolves, that they can take in smell, that they can take in temperature, <laughs> so yes. that you can actually feel how cold it was, what the smell. Because, mm-hmm. you know, when, when, when you make a video, I say when we, when we make a video, and I watch that video back a year later, I'm almost immediately transported back to that time. I can yep, almost feel absolutely. the temperature. I can feel the bitterness of the wind. I can feel if mm-hmm. I got wet from a wave or whatever it may have been. So Absolutely. the video is fantastic because it does bring everything together, not just only from us making it, but also from the viewer watching it. Because you don't know, like people look at an image, they don't know the story of how much planning you brought, how far you mm-hmm. had to hike. Was it just you just pulled over to the side of the road and you parked the car and there was the shot? Or did you have to go somewhere else? And the video helps to be able to tell that story, which is phenomenal. I think, you know what? I mean, Chris, I think, uh, and again, we will touch on it, you know, but from the, the, the video point of view, I think video now has started to really get into your soul as well because it's something I think that you're very, very good at and we'll discuss it as well Thank later you. on. So, yeah, you know, you, you did a good job kind of hijacking the uh, the channel anyway. For, for, for... <laughs> right. And, you know, maybe, Mike, if I ask you this question, you know, um, you mentioned it there a second ago, how it would have evolved but if I was to ask you right now, okay, Mike, what is your YouTube channel? What would you describe your YouTube channel as? I would say it's always about adventure. It's about inspiring people to get out and, and explore. That's what I like to do. I like watching videos that, have, that make me feel that way. So that's the type of video that we kind of like to create is something that will inspire people to get out and just explore, whether it's with their camera, whether it's you know camping, or, you know, if they have an RV or something like that, we've done a, f- a couple videos, you know, showing our RV that mm-hmm. we purchased this year. Um, so it, it's anything like that, just inspiring people to get out and, and get out of their house and explore, whether it's locally or it's an, another country. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, a lot of it, a lot of the world at the moment is locally anyway. Oh, yeah. Choice, you know? so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, I, I, I've learned that one for the last 12 months, been pretty much on a five oh. kilometer radius let's put it that way but yeah it's good because you know when you're also thinking and i think about this as well is that um when i'm making a video it's a place that i'm kind of i won't say bored with but it's a place i take for granted but mm-hmm. somebody else has yes. never seen that somebody else this is fresh in their eyes and if you can inspire them to go jesus hang on i can go close to my own home because there's a place i think that might be similar to that that to me is 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 a winner because i love getting feedback like that from places that i go visit but when i look at the places you guys visit i'm like oh yeah man i can't oh i, I want to go there i want to go there <laughs> you know so i think it kind of goes full circle in that way because if you're seeing something regularly you kind of take it for granted but when you yes. look at it on video you can tell a whole whole different story and you know chris there was one video there that, that you edited i think it was one of the first ones i think that you edited actually and i remember commenting it at the time going wow that intro was incredible because you had an incredible amount of cut scenes. It was to the beat. There was different camera angles. There was drone footage. And I was like, oh, man, it was it was incredible. <laughs> so, you know, do you, do you enjoy the actual filming or the edit? I think I would enjoy both. But most of the time, Mike is the cameraman, I guess. Mm-hmm. So I think I like the editing a lot because it allows me to tell the story. Mm hmm. So I, I just grab, you know, the clips and put them together or just like random clips and put them together into something that makes sense. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I think that is what I enjoy a lot about it. But I think, you know, if I ever could get the camera in my hands when Mike <laughs> finally lets go of it, I would probably also enjoy filming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, you heard it here. No, you say you're going to have to give the camera well, over now shortly. Yeah, I know, so, I know. You know First, it was the YouTube channel. Next, it's the DSLR. So you'll be taking everything over and then Mike will just be the bystander <laughs> going, what are we going to do next, Chris? <laughs> um, I really like and, your hat. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose a question that I think, I think is an interesting one for me, right? Because like you mentioned there a second ago, the different types of uh, landscapes that we can go take photographs of. 
but there's a huge different type of photography that you can do as well. So, you know, I'm a seascape photographer. I love being near the sea. It, it, mm -hmm. it fills my soul. It refreshes my soul. And more often than not, there's no mobile or cell signal. So nobody can annoy me. So that's what I love it as well is because it's a complete release, right? From right. your point of view, you know, you've got mountains, you've got deserts, you've got clear skies for Astro. You get some mm -hmm. incredible storms. I mean, have you both got a favorite style or favorite type of photography from what you've shot to date? Yeah, I would say for me, I, I really enjoy storms. Storms are, are just, they're unpredictable for the most part. I mean, you can, you know, there's some really good storm photographers out there who can, you know, see what's going on and kind of put themselves in position to, you know, capture some really amazing moments. But mm -hmm. storms are, they're just so dynamic. And some of the best light I have ever seen has been right before or right after a storm. Yeah. Uh, when things are starting to clear up and you get maybe a little bit of a, a gap in the horizon where that sun pops through right before sunset and you get all that, you know, just really, really dramatic light. So I know those moments when it does happen is, is some of the most exciting moments and you're running around just absolutely crazy. And uh, it's just, it, it's fantastic. So for me, some of the most exciting uh, photography trips that I've had or outings have been during storms. So yeah, we, and we get those monsoon storms in the summertime yeah. here that are just, uh, and get pretty wild, lots of lightning and, and thunder and stuff like that. So there's a bit of a danger to it, which automatically attracts me, of course, because I'm not very bright. So <laughs> <laughs> don't touch the electric fence. Oh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yep. yeah. St storm photography is something that, you know, we don't get that many storms here because in Ireland, we're right on the Atlantic. So everything is still water based as such. So there's not much dryness that's going to be able to have from that. Plus, we don't get much fluctuations in temperature either. I mean, you know, there's an old phrase in Ireland is that the only difference between the summer and the winter is that in the summer, the rain is warmer. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and it is true, you know, so like when we do get storms, though, it's incredible. I love exactly that. The adrenaline hit that you get immediately. Oh, yes. It's Absolutely. so addictive. Now, I mean, something I've always wanted to do for years is to go to the U.S. during monsoon season and mm -hmm. go take some photographs. I mean, I've seen some incredible work. Your guys work as well, but I've seen some incredible work. Totality, let's just say that I'm going, oh, man. I, want, yeah. I remember the first time seeing these supercells and I'm thinking, no, no, that can't be real. No, no, no. <laughs> you know? They're just so immense, so big and so powerful. Oh, just wild. Yeah, we were trying to, to do some of that this May. I got a buddy of mine, Mike Mejul, who does those. Uh, like, yeah. Every year he's out there in the, uh, in the Midwest and he's chasing these, uh, the tornadoes and the supercells and stuff. And he was out here last uh, summer for monsoon season as well and just uh, – one of those guys that he can put himself in that position. He knows how to read everything and, and uh, just absolutely fantastic. And it's some of the stories he tells are, are pretty crazy. Oh, for sure. Yeah. He's just back as well from photographing volcanoes. Yeah. Yeah. He just came back from Guatemala, just photographing volcanoes over there. I was uh, a bit jealous. I was texting them, telling them that <laughs> a bit. I, I'm no, no longer friends with them because he went without me. So <laughs> you, you were a bit jealous. Oh, geez. I was a lot yeah, jealous. Oh, I was like, time. oh my God. Big time. Wow. Yeah, incredible. Um, and Chris, how about you? Have you got a favorite style of photography? Yeah, I feel very boring now, but <laughs> <laughs> after all of this excitement, uh, I'm drawn towards the small scenes in nature, like patterns on rocks or frost on leaves. Mm -hmm. That just, uh, that's super exciting to me. Um, mm -hmm. And I also, also really, really like trees. Well, you know what? Trees for me are something that I've actually started to fall more in love with over the last year because I can't go to the sea because I can't move. So I have mm -hmm. a woodland next to me here. And just like that, as you say, um, I started now as well to try and look for the areas that I normally would walk over that you mm -hmm. all of a sudden you're going, geez, look at this. I never saw that. And, like, you know, the intimate detail in the woodland or the intimate detail in a rock is something that I think makes people stand above head and shoulders of others because literally you're walking by them or you're walking over them whereas if you stop and look for these things there's a whole different world there at your feet um mm -hmm. and actually i was talking to mike mezzel on this actually on clubhouse last week and i asked him a question because he said he was doing a lot more with uh, macro lenses and i gave him the comparison i was like is it similar when you're looking at your macro lens at the ground is that when you're in a helicopter looking down from above and it actually mm -hmm. kind of is because you can see like the much, much bigger patterns that you'd see from a helicopter, but they're replicated in such a small area when you get in close with the lens as well. So, you know, I think 
it's it's not a, maybe it's not as exciting or or dramatic full, filled with adrenaline but there's a huge attraction to finding mm-hmm. something that ordinarily is not the vista that everybody pulls up on the bus and pulls out and goes click and they're back in the bus and gone you're having to go and find those images mm-hmm. and finding those things you know so that's for me what I love about that you know yeah and i i think it's also you know when you're standing at a place like the grand canyon and everybody's looking at the canyon and how deep it is and you know photographing the view and i just turn around and photograph the completely opposite, side. <laughs> opposite direction yeah <laughs> and i'm all by myself and you know nobody around me no uh, tripod mm. wars or anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so exactly. So that's actually, yeah. you know, quite relaxing. Mm-hmm. Oh, for sure, for sure. And I think, you know what, like the, the three of us could go photograph exactly the same place and the three of us would come away with completely different images, which oh, I think absolutely. is an interesting thing as well, you know. Um, yeah. And I really like that idea of looking for the intimate detail. And again, like I say, trees. Yeah, you know, I think everybody knows Mally Davis at this stage, but Mally is completely in love with trees and he has, you know, some phenomenal shots that again, you kind of go, Jesus, what? And all of a sudden you'd look and go, I saw that in the last video, but now you've got a beautiful photograph. He goes, yeah, because I was keeping my eye on that tree for a long while because I wanted to get it in the right conditions. So mm-hmm. yeah, trees right. trees are full of character. I love that as well. So yeah, don't be uh, putting it down that it's not as, as exciting as Storm. <laughs> I think it's actually equally as exciting, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I suppose I want to ask you both the question here, going on a shoot, right? Would you both now equally plan a shoot together? Would you plan a separate shoot in different ways, considering, you know, Mike, you're looking for one type of photograph, Chris, you're looking for a different type of photograph, and they're both going to need different conditions. So how does planning a shoot uh, happen with you guys? I know, Mike, you use a lot of apps and such like that before we even get into the apps, but from the planning of the location, first and foremost. We both can go out pretty much in any condition and and try and find something. Uh, so I don't think we really take into consideration the, the differences of, of our styles when we plan a shoot. I think that if there's going to be good conditions, whether it's, you know, high altitude clouds or a storm or something, I think we're both motivated to go out and we'll figure out from there, you know, our own styles and, and, and what kind of photos we want to take. So when it comes to planning, I think it's more of just uh, looking at the conditions and, hey, you want to go out? All right, let's go. So there's not, not too much. Um, consideration when planning as far as our styles go. Would you use um, photo pills a lot? I do. Um, I, I like to, especially with astrophotography, mm-hmm. I like to use photo pills, uh, at least seeing when the, the new moon and when the moon's going to be up and the location of the Milky Way when you're actually on, on location trying to scout for, let's say, a composition. Uh, it's, it's really such a handy app. And uh, of course, it goes into a lot more detail with other things, uh, exposure times for, you know, star trails and things like that and hyperfocal distance and all these. It's a it's a pretty amazing app for photographers. And if you don't have it, I'd, I'd highly recommend it. Uh, I've, I've used it quite a bit and mm. just about every type of photography, you know, mm. finding out when sunrise is, sunset is, when the moon sets, uh, planning a full moon shot is also a great way to use that app as well. I know Josh Cripps has some amazing, amazing a uh, full moon shots that he's yeah. planned out with that app. And it's just uh, absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. He's got one shot actually with the guy with the camel. Um, yes. That, that would uh, eclipse. Like, $1 million yeah. dollar shot. <laughs> yeah. It's a million dollar yeah. shot right there, man. That's a yeah. lot of hard work and planning. And just, uh, I think that was the first shot actually that turned me on to his work. And I actually have been talking to him. I meant to get him on last September, but just time went from both of us. So we, I must go back to him again. I'll see if I can get him back in again now. But yeah, I meant to get him onto the podcast to discuss that exact shot because that mm-hmm. completely blew me away. Man. But, yeah. you know, and, and you know, and we mentioned there about video and such like that because I remember at the time seeing the shot and going, wow, how much planning was put into that. But then I looked mm-hmm. on Instagram and he had gone through all the different things that he planned all the step of the way. He made videos about it and everything else. And that yeah. is what makes, I think, the video so uh, immersive, you know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, just it's yeah. so impressive. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, Chris, from your point of view with planning a shoot, is there any kind of different to what Mike has mentioned there that you would consider before you go on a shoot? I would say usually when we go to a place, we're both drawn to different things, but mm-hmm. it doesn't really matter where we're going. We usually come away with like one shot that is the same and okay. then everything else is, is mm. completely different. And as far as planning goes, we both have ideas that we want to, you know, for example, this summer, I would like to get a shot of the lupins. I think they're called the lupines. Beautiful flowers. 
that uh, grow in the mountains here, just with these flowers and a lake reflection of mountains. Wow. Nice. So we trying to plan a trip around this photo that I want to take this year. And then Mike has another idea, you know, like he wants to shoot the, probably the Milky Way somewhere. <laughs> because he's so much into astro. Um, and that way we, we kind of both can realize our projects through the mm. months. Yeah, my, my favorite app for the planning is um, Meteo Blue. Okay. It's all about weather. Okay. And I'm really interested in the weather. I really like, you know, plan what's going on with the clouds and everything. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. is usually what I use when Mike is checking photo pills. I'm on Meteo Blue looking, you know, I have to do clouds or no or what's going on. Yeah, and it's sure. right about 50% of the time, which is actually pretty good for a weather app. <laughs> <laughs> I know. They're never accurate. Oh, they're no. never accurate. It's absolutely frustrating. You can get three apps all looking at the same thing in three different conditions that they'll give you. And yes. the actual conditions won't be any of the ones that the three would have given. Any so. of them, exactly. But, but hey, do you know what? If it was easy, then everybody would be doing it. So, you know, that's yeah, just the reality true. of it, yeah. Yeah. So look, like, what we're going to do here is we're going to take a very, very quick break, okay? And we'll be right back. I want to discuss more about workshops with you. So we'll be right back after this. If you're enjoying this episode of the Irish Photography Podcast, why not jump back and listen to the back catalogue we have of episodes, where you'll get some great insights from fantastic guests, gear reviews, lots of hints and tips, and above all else, keeping you company while you drive or relax. Thanks very much for listening. Please consider subscribing, leaving a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And you're very welcome back to the Irish Photography Podcast. So, guys, like I said there before the last break, you'd like to talk a bit more in relation to uh, workshops, you know? So, like, mm -hmm. you guys would, in, in the past anyway, have run workshops, and I'm sure in the future we'll be running workshops again. So, can, before we kind of get into the detail of it, why do you think people need to attend a workshop? I mean, what will attendees learn and what will they gain from a workshop? Well, for me, what I've noticed running workshops is a lot of these people, they, they watch YouTube and they watch all these tips. You know, there's so many videos. It seems like there's one every day with, you know, the five tips for improving your photography or the seven beginner mistakes seven, or yeah. three things I wish I knew earlier. You know, you, you get a lot of that and people, they, they watch these tips and, you know, they're great tips. They're, there's nothing wrong with them. But when they get out in the field, they don't know how to put that into practice. Mm -hmm. And so what we find is these people, they watch these videos, they learn all these things, but there's just so many of those tips that they just kind of get lost in the weeds with it. And they don't know how to put that into practice out in the field. So we end up going over a lot of the things, especially what I've noticed is focus. Focus is a big one. That's with astrophotography mm -hmm. or that's with, you know, even just basic landscape photography. I found that a lot of people have struggle with, with focus a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting you say it there that you can go on YouTube and you can learn from YouTube or you can pick up a book and you can learn from a book. But when you're out mm -hmm. in the field, as I would have said to Chris earlier on, the light is different every single time and the light mm -hmm. is going to change how you're going to take that photograph. So like by going on a workshop and I, it's interesting, actually, you know, that you, Chris, you were on a workshop and just where you guys met, like you can meet so many people that are going yes. through a similar journey, maybe they might be behind you in the advancement or ahead of you in the advancement, and they can give you a hint and tip that you may not have thought of, but not on because of a video or not because of a book, but because of what you're both looking at in front of you. And I mm -hmm. think that's mm -hmm. the key thing, you know, because like everybody that's going on a workshop is going there. Okay. Number one, I think for photography, but deep down, mm -hmm. you're going there for people because you enjoy the experience. You enjoy the place that you're going to. You enjoy the food. You enjoy the drink. You enjoy the laughs. You enjoy the journey. But guess what? At the end of it, you come back with something, which is hopefully some images that you're, mm -hmm. you're happy with. But right. if you're there on your own and you can't get this image, like you say, focus, I think, is really, really important because you can't fix mm -hmm. that later. No matter what right, you want to right. do, you cannot fix that later. So, you know, I think from... People going on a workshop, it's always beneficial, I think anyway, to be able to learn not only from the workshop instructors, but also the people that are part of that group. Because you'll probably pick up something there then that the instructor may not have thought to tell you or that you may not have thought to ask the instructor because you weren't, I can't ask them that. They, they, they think I don't know what I'm talking about or whatever it may have been. But by talking to the person that's next to you, they'll give you the answer. And I think that's where... A workshop to me has huge benefits. So you say there about you know with with um, uh, focus. How about if somebody has all the best gear, 
but they've no idea mm-hmm. how to use it. Right. That, yeah, mm-hmm. that, that happens too. And uh, like you said, it's, you end up learning just as much from the other people as you do, you know, from the workshop leaders. And we get a lot of questions like that. Uh, someone comes up with a Nikon D850 or the new Sony, mm-hmm. um, but they've never taken it off auto before, you know, and yeah. they, they really don't know. They're like, why is this photo sharp here, but not back here? And they have no idea why, you know, and they just, they, they have these questions and they've watched all the YouTube videos and, and they've seen every one of these, you know, tips videos and they just, they don't know how to apply that to what they're looking at hands on, you know, all these tips you have, but how to apply that to the scene you're looking at and what to do. It's uh, it's amazing how many people are, that have that the similar situation. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I suppose, you know, Chris, then from your point of view, you, you know, you probably would be looking at different scenes again to the standard inverted commas landscape photographer who'd come along, plant the tripod almost at eye height and start taking the typical shot that most people would take. So, you know, I think from your point of view, I think you've got a lot to add as well then on that is to have you considered looking this or have you considered thinking about that or have you considered Mm -hmm. this as a type of shot? So is that something that, you know, you think from your own perspective is a good aspect as well within the workshop environment to be able to share those nuggets with people that they may not even have thought of? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also, you know, we usually the workshops we're doing here in the area are places that are well known and photographed a million times. And I still think you should take that shot. You know, when you're there, you need to take that shot because it is famous for a reason. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, But then there's also so many other things to see. And I think especially when people start out with photography, they shoot all of these things because they just, they don't like just one thing, you know, they like a multitude of things. Mm -hmm. And I always like to encourage people to shoot that multitude of things. If you like something, if you're drawn to a certain scene, just take a photo because it's not just all about the one view and the one photo that someone maybe took a million times. Absolutely. You know what I think? And it's really, really important as well from that point of view, because as you say, you know, the places that you'll bring people maybe locally. So like, let me ask you, where would you, again, normally hold your Mm. workshops? What sort of locations would you bring people to? Uh, Generally, we're always around the Southwest, Arizona, California, national parks. We go to quite a bit, uh, which is always fun for the uh, the bureaucracy (laughs) inside the the national parks are all, you know, all the paperwork and fees and stuff. But uh, you know, we, we try and go to a place where, you know, there's some iconic places, but you can also explore quite a bit and really start stretching your creative legs. Uh, things like Joshua Tree or the Grand Canyon even. And we really try and teach people uh, to explore their own creativity. You know, like you mentioned earlier, all three of us can go out and to the same exact location and come away with three different photos. Mm-hmm. And so on workshops, we try and, and help foster that. In, in, within the workshop, you know, we have these people go out and we don't tell them, here, sit your tripod right here and take this shot. You know, that's, that not, that's not going to help them, you know. So what we try and do is let them do their own thing, but we talk to them. What do you want to learn in this workshop? You know, what are you looking for? What, are, what is something you want to improve on? And then we kind of let them do their own thing and follow them around and come back and, and maybe fine tune what they're looking at and, and teach them that whatever it is they see, uh, is going to be different than somebody else's. So explore that, you know, find that subject and explore it. You know, don't just take that shot and leave and, and take the, the big wide open landscape, but, you know, really explore your creativity and, and, and find that subject that you like. And, and uh, usually works out pretty well. Yeah, for sure. And, I, you know, something got me thinking when I was putting the thing together here was, you know, like you've got experience with dealing with different types of attendees. And it got me thinking and saying, you know, what would be one of the biggest challenges that attendees would encounter? Now, the first answer that came to mind to me was normally people go in a workshop and they bring everything. They bring the kitchen sink. Like they can't mm-hmm. even lift the bag because they've got every single lens that they possibly could ever own. And they're bringing it on mm-hmm. this workshop because guess what? Just in case I want to make sure I have that. So uh-huh. that would be that, that would be my answer to it. But from your point of view, I suppose, what would be the biggest challenges that attendees would have to face and overcome in a workshop? Maybe, Chris, if you want to take that first. Yeah, I think it's composition. Mm-hmm. I think so many people struggle with that. I struggle with that. I think this is where, you know, a lot of people can improve, like, ways. So, 
Yeah, I would say it's composition. Yeah, people, okay. and, and then sometimes it's just little things too. You know, moving your tripod down six inches or over to the right three inches or back or forward. Just these couple of inches can create space between, you know, elements in your photo. There's just so many little things that people don't uh, take into consideration. You know, like you mentioned earlier with the, taking a 3D uh, scene and t- making it a 2D photo. But there's things you can do to make it feel like there's more depth, like it's, that it's not on a piece of paper. Yeah. And uh, I think people don't maybe, they don't think about that when they're out there taking photos. Uh, it's these little, these little adjustments that can make a big difference. And, uh, you know, everybody's heard of things like the rule of thirds and all these other, other things that, that are hammered in their head to death. But when they go out in the field, um, that doesn't always work. Or mm. it's not, you know, it's very robotic and technical. And, and they, don't t- they don't stop and pay attention to some of the smaller things that are going on as well. And actually, that brings me an interesting point here, say, about paying attention. Because, you know, if people are going off out on a workshop, they want to come back with something that's good. But Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've met people that come on a workshop and they think they already know all the answers. And they're Mm -hmm. not really open to a bit of suggestion. But then afterwards, they look in the computers and they're like, Jesus, how did you get that shot? Well, you know, I, I moved six inches. And oh, shit, I, should, I should have listened, you know, so like a big thing I think from that is, you know, if people are going in a workshop, they should go with an open mind anyway, number one, that they're, you mm-hmm. never know everything. You're always going to learn from somebody at some point, but always take the advice and even try and take that shot, you know, um, and I, I'm, I'm not a, a professional photographer. I'm an amateur photographer. I'm not a workshop leader. I've gone on workshops with people because I said, you know what, I want to go, I want to learn from them, but I also mm-hmm. want to learn from others as well. And I found that number one, I think a big a big kind of obstacle people need to overcome is what their expectation of the workshop is in the first instance, because mm-hmm. everybody has anxiousness within them. And when they're meeting new people, oh, what if they don't like me? What if they're all better than mm-hmm. me? What if I can't? So it's about making people feel welcome, feel grounded, you know, feel as part of a support group that you can mess up. It's okay. Nobody's going to judge you just because you didn't know that you moved the camera to the left and all of a sudden you got separation between these two, these two trees that were 50 feet away. But all right. of a sudden it, it changed your image. So with that point of view, I think people should really come with an open mind, would you think? Yes, absolutely. And that's one of the things that any, I think most of the workshop leaders will do is they'll sit down before the workshop or at the beginning of the workshop and uh, go over some of the things individually with participants and what they really want to learn and what they should expect. And, you know, that way the participants are getting what they want, you know, and, and sometimes that can be tough. Some people don't like to talk a lot. And I know I was that way when I attended, you know, like Thomas Heaton's and Brendan Vanson's in Patagonia a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was pretty quiet and shy and, and really didn't uh, say a whole lot. And I'd ask questions here and there, but, you know, a lot of times it's, it can be, uh, you know, hard to ask those questions out. Like you don't want to have ask the wrong question or maybe it's a dumb question or, or, you know, and there's things like that. So sometimes it's up to the, the, the workshop leaders to, to go out of their way to be like, Hey, you know, what's going on? Come over there and, and, and talk, you know, and, and bring that out of the participants, which can be, can be challenging sometimes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And speaking of challenges, you know, like I alluded to a moment ago, I, this last year has been completely an upside down world. You know, I know you guys would have had workshops that were planned and you postponed them and then you had to cancel them and then you had to reschedule them and then you had to reschedule those reschedules and such like that. So, you know, <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm sure it's really been, you know, a big, big challenge and a struggle to make sure that you can keep all that going. But how have you both managed to overcome that and how have you diversified? So I guess, you know, it was a real struggle for me. <laughs> yeah. It all went downhill last year. I mean, you know, life for everybody. Absolutely. But yeah. I, I, I got my work permits at the beginning of last year. Okay. So I was already in lockdown basically since I moved here. You know, I couldn't really do anything. Yeah, not even geez, uh, yeah. voluntary work. I was not allowed to do anything at all. So I was really looking forward to the moment when I finally could, you know, start mm-hmm. working and getting some... A structure in my day yeah it was hard when uh, everything we had to change around the workshops and stuff so uh, one day in summer of last year i was uh, sitting down working on a video one of our videos actually and uh, and mike was sitting next to me and i probably have to say that he he taught me everything about premiere pro the video uh, editing software we use and then story, he was like, yeah. wow, what, what are you doing here? You know, you're, this, is, this is a new trick. I, I didn't even know about it. And uh, he encouraged me to, you know, maybe 
you should reach out to someone that uh, could use your help mm -hmm. as a video editor. And uh, yeah, Mike is brilliant, so <laughs> this is what I did. <laughs> now she's now she's the student has become the master. <laughs> <laughs> she's a much much better uh, video editor than I ever was. It's pretty fascinating and pretty impressive, honestly. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I mean, look, I alluded to it earlier on. I mean, I was blown away by some of the early edits that you'd done on the channel. And I, I remember commenting going, wow, this is a new mic. No, that wasn't me. That was Chris. I was like, wow, <laughs> well done. Like, you know what I mean? Because like, you definitely have a flair for it and you definitely have an eye for telling a story. And as you said, you know, you're taking random clips and you're putting them together in, some, in a cohesive form factor of a story that brings somebody mm -hmm. along with that story. But it's about the, the cut to beat, you know, it's, people mm -hmm. don't even realize that it's so integral and so important. It's about making a, a, a good transition as well. So you kept the gray matter going, I imagine then, and kind of said, you know what? Yeah, I could be good at this. Let's play around with this some more. And then you reached out to, mm -hmm. uh, as you say, to some people saying, maybe you can help out with those. And now you're doing video editing for others at the moment. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I, uh, I reached out to one person that I was watching for a while already and really enjoyed her content mm -hmm. and uh, she was growing very fast and I thought you know this could be the moment that maybe she needs someone uh, at the back end to work on her videos um, because it's not you know she's it's not a photography channel it has okay. nothing to do with photography at all so these people you know they're not photographers so they don't know anything about the Adobe programs or or probably any editing software at all Mm -hmm. So I uh, sent her an email. She agreed that I can start working for her. Brilliant. And now it's been almost a year that, that I work for her. And she introduced me to another YouTuber, also a very successful female creator. And it's just awesome to help them add value to their brand. Brilliant. And it's also, you know, it's nice to have a like, steady income besides the photography business that... Mm -hmm. um, is balancing out the photography income because as you maybe know, photography income is very, um, it's fluctuating a lot. Yeah. You know, one month you don't sell anything at all and then the next month is going good. And mm -hmm. so the mm -hmm. video editing helps me balancing that out. Brilliant. Well, I, I think well done. Congratulations. You know, and it's, it's something that like if you put your heart and soul into something, you will get a result from it. And that's mm -hmm. something I believe in and others can see that then as well. So much so that they want you to do that for them. So that's, Phenomenal. Well done on that, Chris. I, I love that idea. Thank you. And, you know, Mike, I suppose then from even on, on, on the workshop side of things with the, the rescheduling, I mean, that in itself is, is a job, you know, because you have to reschedule yes. and reschedule and then reschedule the reschedule. So it's been a shitstorm of a year. I mean, oh, man, you know, I don't think anybody could have predicted it like, but particularly from a, a, a workshop point of view, like it's a bread and butter, man, you know, you, you yeah. need it. And that's where the challenge comes in. So like, are you at the moment now just continuing to keep them on the burner, keep the scheduling going and such like that? Yeah, we've, uh, we've got a couple coming up actually next month. Everything's starting to open up again. All the hotels are open again, you know, with everybody starting to get vaccinated. Uh, we're, we're hopeful and we have uh, two workshops actually next month in California, uh, Death Valley and Joshua Tree. Um, I think still the industry and, you know, it's still a little slow and people don't have the confidence yet. Um, but we've talked to the participants that have signed up and they, you know, that they're vaccinated and they are, you know, willing to come out. And, you know, we have these new rules with COVID and things like that, that we can, uh, you know, that we have to do working in these national parks. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we finally have started to again, but it's still very slow. And uh, we probably won't get full going probably until next year, to be honest with you. Yeah. We've, it's uh, still, still touch and go and still, uh, you know, still, still a tough situation for sure. I think the only good thing about a shitty situation like that is that everybody is in it. It's not just one particular yes. thing on its own. So, Absolutely. you know, I hope, I hope that things kind of can go back to a bit nor of normality sooner rather than later. Um, and I'm sure, you know what, even in, you know, the ones you say in, uh, Joshua Tree there I think that will be phenomenal if it goes ahead in two mm -hmm. months and if not if it goes ahead in three months so be it but exactly. you know, people that Joshua Tree isn't going anywhere soon so the only thing there <laughs> right. is that you just got to plug the timing I suppose back in around it um, right. and something else I suppose I'd like to touch on there is like, going back to when I, again you know the, the, the YouTube ecosystem and the U YouTube sphere you know you both have done uh, different things over the years and as you say like you know you met each other 
by going on workshops with other people. So, like, one of the things I wanted to kind of ask was, you know, like Brendan Vanson, Thomas Heaton, you know, Greg Snell, uh, you know, mm-hmm. really, really good guys, really, really passionate about photography. How have you found working with these guys in different collabs and such like that? Has it been beneficial to your photography? Has it been beneficial to your business? Has it been beneficial to your YouTube channel? Or, or what? All the above. All the above. Those guys are probably three of the guys that we really look up to a lot. Uh, Brendan, we've gotten to know really well. We ran a workshop with him last year. I've attended his workshops. Uh, I'm able to talk to him pretty much whenever I have a question and uh, specifically like business type stuff, man. He's just absolutely brilliant. And one of the hardest working people I've, yeah. like, I've ever met. Yeah. So uh, guys like that. And then Thomas Heaton too. I, I mean, like everybody else, he's just been so inspirational with the style of photography and, and just uh, being able to watch his videos. If, if I watch any, any landscape photography videos, it's going to be his because it's always, uh, you know, right. Well, exactly what I need at the time that I need it. When I want to get out, if I'm lacking motivation or inspiration, uh, you know, and he's such a nice guy too, you know, mm-hmm. and, and quite funny when we went on the Patagonia workshop up until that point, his YouTube channel, uh, was huge, but he, he didn't really show his, his humorous side all that much. But then, I mean, since then it's been, you know, you can see it a lot, but you know, you never yeah. realize it until you actually meet him. He's, he's hilarious. Yeah. He's a funny yeah. guy. Yeah, he is. You know, I mean, I've had Thomas on podcast what twice i think maybe three times i can't remember at this point in time because it's in that way it's just you, you're just talking to people you know and like i really see that as well as a down to earth person and that's the most important part because people build up their own persona of somebody mm-hmm. without even meeting that person and when you look at a youtube ecosystem all you're seeing is what you're seeing on the screen but you're not seeing the humor that goes on behind that and one case in point to that is greg and when Greg did the <laughs> F4 Greg. trip, you know, with the lads, and I mean, um, I was talking to Gavin uh, Hardcastle in relation to it, and I said to him, where did this character come from? Like, you know, he said, <laughs> it was Greg's idea. And I was like, what? He said, yeah. And Greg decided he wanted to grow the mustache and everything else and became Brody McBra. <laughs> Bra. And I'm like, oh my God. Man. But like, I, I've talked to Greg about it as well. And it's just so, so down to earth. And that's the most important thing yes. about it. You know? He's such a great um, guy. Yeah, we love Greg. Yeah, Greg is, you know what? I mean, he's no all his latest news and everything else, his whole world is now going to be changing yeah. over the next few months, let's just say literally, you know? So yeah, it's uh, it's always interesting because I think, I think I might've come across your work actually from one of those videos, I think at the time. Um, hmm. Maybe it was the Patagonia one or I don't know actually, maybe that, I can't remember. Or was it something with Brendan Vanson actually that you were somewhere as well? I can't remember what it was, but I think I came across you guys anyway. Um, they originally hmm. from the, the group of guys, let's okay. just say, overall. Nice. You know? Yeah, but a good That's bunch of awesome. people, as you say, you know, it's really interesting. Yeah, great group of guys. Yeah, yeah we got to send the fruit basket to Brendan. Then. Yeah, we got to send a fruit basket. <laughs> Brendan and Tom are the reason why we're together, so we got to send them a fruit basket. <laughs> yeah, you, you do, yeah. Or even better still, when hopefully we can all travel again, go to Portugal and go to the coffee studio. and Yes, coffee, yes, you know? and telling him we need to get our, get our butts over there and uh, spend a bunch of money on his mm-hmm. coffee, so. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, well, listen, look, that was really interesting there. That's the second part now, done and dusted. So I'm going to come back for the final part. And in the final part, I got a staple set of three questions that I ask every guest. And I'm going to ask both of you as well that. So we'll be right back after this. If you're enjoying this episode of the Irish Photography Podcast, why not jump back and listen to the back catalogue we have of episodes, where you'll get some great insights from fantastic guests, gear reviews, lots of hints and tips, and above all else, keeping you company while you drive or relax. Thanks very much for listening. Please consider subscribing, leaving a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And you're very welcome back to the final part of the Irish Photography Podcast. So guys, like I said there in part two, we've got a staple set of three questions that we ask every single guest. And even though I've got two guests on this evening, I'm still going to ask you the same three questions. But I'll ask the first one. You can decide who wants to take it. It's a funny story. So, Mike and Chris Perea, what is your funny photography story? Okay, I guess I'll go. So my uh, funny story is, is funny now, but it wasn't funny at the time. They're the best ones. So yeah. I was, yeah, exactly. So I was uh, shooting in the Superstition Mountains here locally and uh, shooting astrophotography with a buddy of mine. And we hiked in for sunset and we're shooting, you know, turn around, photographing the Milky Way when it came up. And it's probably midnight, one o'clock in the morning. And we kept hearing the sound. Off in the distance, it sounded like a maybe like a baby deer or something. It was it was an odd sound, 
and it would get louder and then quieter. About every 30 seconds, we would hear it. And wasn't really sure what, what it was, you know, like, oh, that's, you know, there's mountain lions in the, in the area. So we were like, that thing better shut up or else it's going to get eaten by a mountain lion. You know, it's, mm -hmm. that's a baby deer. But the more we heard it, it didn't sound like a baby deer. So we, we're sitting up on top of this giant, giant rock. I mean, we had to crawl up across some other rocks. It was quite a bit to get to. And it was a big overhang looking over a big valley. And so it was behind us, the sound was coming from. So after about 30 minutes, I decided to walk back over and just to kind of get a, a closer ear to it. Cause you can't see it. it's absolutely pitch black in the middle of the desert. So as I went back on the other side of this big rock we were on, uh, I heard it again. And this time, as soon as I heard it, I knew what it was. And it was coming from underneath us. And the moment I heard it, I knew. And I, it, was a, it was a mountain lion cub. We ah. were standing on top of a mountain lion den. What? We had got, we had got there at sunrise, or sunset. So we kind of hiked up. And after sunset, we had hiked up on this area in the dark. So we really couldn't see what was going on. But the getting louder and quieter was this cub coming out and calling and then going back in. And so right out then, I talked about, we got to get the hell out of here. So we had our tripods in our hand, like I was ready to swing. And we didn't know where the mom was at, you know, probably out hunting, but we weren't sure. And not that, you know, we don't really worry too much about mountain lions. They're around. They're everywhere. Um, you, you won't see them, but they're, they are there. Cub. Uh, the one exception is if there's a cub involved, and that's the one time where you're just, that, that's not a situation wow. you want to be in. So we just hightailed it as fast as we could, and we had our <laughs> tripods in our hand just ready <laughs> to swing if that mountain lion mom was going to be around. And it, it has been sighted in that area several times. That's a pretty famous wow. hike we were on, uh, just not at night, you know. So that's an uh, added element that's Jesus not Christ, exciting man. at all is, is having that. Uh, you know, real, realizing at that moment what, what had happened and what, it was, what was going on and realized my buddy and I were standing on top of the fun. By the time we got halfway, because it's a three-mile hike in the dark in the desert to our car, and, uh, yeah, about halfway out, we kind of started calming down a little bit and we started laughing about it. It's like, man, that was, uh, that's something on there. That feeling was something on there that was sheer terror, realizing the situation. Oh, absolutely. You with that, <laughs> uh, gee, that could have gone pear-shaped in an instant. Oh, like absolutely. In an instant. <laughs> absolutely. Luckily, I think I'm in faster than my buddy, so I think I could have outrun him. He, he, was, he <laughs> yeah. was screwed. I, I think I would have been all right. I just could have hit him in his knee and took off, so... <laughs> <laughs> my god almighty man that's just incredible i'd be scared absolutely shitless yeah, from stuff was, like that yeah, yeah. we don't have we, we don't have those mountain lines here thankfully but my god almighty like i could just imagine when you're there going what's that sound they want to be quiet as you say the mountain lion will get it but it's right underneath you yeah and you can't you know in the dark in, in canyons like that you can't judge how far a sound is coming from how loud it is how close it is to you uh it's just it's very um confusing to, to to try and pinpoint something like that in the dark in a canyon yeah. and so when i got closer to it and realized it was coming right below us that's when i was like oh this is not a good situation at all we got to get out we i never put my camera away so fast i just threw everything in the bag i don't care about taking my lens out or anything i just everything's thrown in the bag tripod in hand and wow uh, yeah, well, that's, that's most definitely a, <laughs> that's most definitely a first in here for our funny stories in the Irish Photography Podcast. I almost got eaten by yeah, a lion. It's, yeah, it's, it's, fun, it's funny now. <laughs> funny now, yeah, for sure. Funny now. For sure. So, guys, another question that we have here, you know, is what gear do you use? Now, I do happen to know, I suppose, that you both don't use the same camera system. So, I think this could be an interesting one and we could see how this will pan out, right? So, maybe, Chris, if I come to you first, what camera system do you use? What gear do you use? So, I recently switched from DSLR to mirrorless and I shoot okay. now the Canon R5 with the Holy Canon, Trinity. Yeah. <laughs> Canon! <laughs> with the Holy Trinity lenses. And they get a tripod. Very good, very good. How are you find in the R5? Is it everything that you thought it was going to be and more? Or have you got any certain things that you go, I don't use that feature? To be honest, I'm not too gear, you know. I think I could shoot, you know, any other camera and I would be happy. Okay. I'm not very okay. brand loyal, to be honest. But I, what I really like about the R5 is the flippy screen. That mm -hmm. is life changing for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It actually, you know, you know it's, it's, it's very, very handy. Things. It is. Yeah, super absolutely. Handy, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think, look, you know, you say they're the holy trinity of lenses, so they're all two point eight. You've got 
the 70 to 200, 24 to 70, and the 15 to 35, is it? Yes, I only have uh, one 2.8. Okay. The other two lenses are a 4.0. Okay. Or, you know, like lighter backpacks. Yes, absolutely. Reasons and money reasons. <laughs> and money reasons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and money reasons, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so the... from a landscape. Landscape point of view, you you don't need to carry the two point eight all the way out to shoot landscapes. You're never really going to be shooting at two point eight. F four is perfectly fine, I think. But that's yes, just absolutely yes. Also, yeah, I do use yeah. the uh, the only two point eight lens that I have. That's the twenty four to seventy for portraits. Very I mean, good. I use it yeah. for a landscape too, but that's the lens that I usually use for uh, portraits. Yeah, and how how do you find the Gitzo tripod? I have a Gitzo as well myself, and. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll answer the question maybe for you if I can, because, you know, they say never meet your heroes. I mean, I always <laughs> wanted to have a Gitzo tripod. I had an opportunity to get one. It's fine. No problem. But it doesn't. I'm not like going, wow, every time I use it. I don't know. Have you a different experience with the Gitzo? I think it's the, the moment when you're like, wow, is when you use another tripod than a Gitzo. Okay. This is, you know, my, my experience when I'm fumbling with Mike's <laughs> tripod. <laughs> Not that it's bad, but it's just, I guess, a little bit old. <laughs> <laughs> inferior, inferior, How yeah, yeah. Dare yeah. You. So I'm offended. <laughs> the legs don't open so quite easily, and they're hard to put yeah. away. I really, I love my Gitzo. I think it's amazing. It's, uh, you know, I use it a lot, so I yeah. think it's about yeah. time to invest mm. in a few spare parts. Um, yeah, yeah. Some of the. Um, how do you call that? Like the plastic fell off that you used to tighten the tripod. So now oh, I'm just the, the rubber around the knobs oh, fell yeah. off. Yeah. 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 Give him a little update and spring clean and he'll be good to go. Happy days. Happy days. So okay, so you're Canon and Gitzo, you're actually exactly the same as me. No, go on, we'll go over to the dark side there. I know you're not using <laughs> Canon. Go on. Don't tell me. Pentax. Pentax. Go on, yeah. Pentax. Oh no, hey, it could be worse. I could be shooting the Sony or something. So <laughs> <laughs> kidding, kidding, guys. Kidding. No, well look, there is no such thing as a bad camera these days, <laughs> true, right? Let's very, get that out there in actually, the anyway. But Sony's yeah. are Sony's are pretty awesome actually. But no, I shoot an icon. I've shot an icon since I started and I just, the reason why I chose Nikon was literally just Googling the, the entry camera that I was interested in and the two mm -hmm. that were compared and the Nikon was slightly better. So I'm like, okay, I'll get that one. That, that's really the only reason why I bought a Nikon. Um, and I, I mean, I'm very happy with that. I shoot the D850. and uh, Very nice. Very nice. I shoot, uh, so because of the high megapixel, I've decided to go really light with my setup. So I got uh, 16 to 35 F4. And then I shoot okay. a 50 millimeter prime and then the 70 to 200. I'm looking to get the 70 to 200 F4. Um, but yeah, it's uh, just lighter is better for me. And I don't need the 2.8 yeah. unless I'm shooting um, astrophotography, you know. And I do have a 14 to 24 2.8 that sits in my drawer at home. But if I go out and shoot astro, then I'll take that lens out just by itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then and for the... The tripods the that rickety, I use. Yeah, what's the rickety <laughs> tripod you use? Yeah. Yes, Actually, the resistance. Well, I, I say this. Okay, I shoot Benro, and I love the Benro tripod. Ah, Benro is nice. Yeah. Yeah, I have two Benro tripods. I have a giant, the forty-eight CXL, which is just a monster tripod. I call Beast, it my yeah. my Iceland and Patagonia tripod because that thing will hold up to any wind you can put on it. It's it's a beast. Mm -hmm. And then I have a little travel tripod, but I am extremely extremely rough with storms and seascapes and. I like to be right in the water and things hitting, you know, and, and the rain and the snow and just me just dropping things everywhere. I'm, I'm really rough on it. So I've had both of those tripods for, I would say, at least four years. And I Good. clean it like every six months, maybe, if that. So I'm pretty rough with them and I don't take, don't take great care of them. So uh, there's definitely a lot of adjustments with the legs coming loose and things like that, but I'm I'm pretty happy with, it, especially with what they cost compared to things like the Gitzos and the really yes. right stuff and all these. You know, it's literally half price for these these tripods, and I I don't have any any problem with them compared to you know they like said the way I beat them up. How do yeah, they for perform sure. Perform with the mountain lions. So yeah, that big one would have made a nice club for that mountain lion. So uh, that big Absolutely, one, uh, and I had yeah. it. And I had it. <laughs> <laughs> 
But you know what? It's, it, and it's interesting you say something there. It just gets me thinking about tripods, right? Because, you know, Chris, you alluded to there. I said, you know, you better have to have something which is good that you can rely on. Mike, you said it as well, that you can bring it to Patagonia. You know it's going to not fall over and such like mm-hmm. that. How many people have come on workshops with a $10,000 equipment of a camera and a tripod that they bought in Walmart the day before? Yeah, 80%. every workshop, <laughs> mm-hmm. every workshop that happens, you get people with you really know? nice cameras and the the tripods. They they you know find a Amazon special for fifty bucks or something, you know, and it yeah, they it's find sad. out really fast. It's very sad. They find Poor out really. Tripods. Yeah, it makes my heart hurt when I see these expensive cameras on little tripods. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, they find out really fast though what a good tripod, how much of a difference it can make depending on the types mm. of photos you're taking in the areas and stuff but just a little bit of wind can make all all the difference in a bad tripod yeah i mean i i on the last podcast i said it to mark denny actually that um the first day i had my gitso it fell over it got blown Mm -hmm. over by wind Mm -hmm. no thankfully i didn't have the camera on it and (laughs) then it got me even more worried because i was like how did it get blown over it didn't even have a camera there was nothing to catch it but it was Uh just my own fault i hadn't put it down right you know but Mm -hmm. um yeah you know that's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. It's, ne- it's, 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 it's never fallen over Bias since. Remorse. But yeah. Well, look, you know what? I mean, I, I still, I, I'm a seascape photographer, but I've yet to bring that tripod to the sea mm. um, because I've seen what the sea will do to all of the tripods <laughs> oh, that I've had. Oh, yes, you know? absolutely. I mean, yeah, and, and unless you are home, literally, you're in the door and you've got that tripod stripped down in the bath and it's soaking in water, you are going to have salt crystals that are going to form mm-hmm. inside and that mm-hmm. you're going to have sand that's going to be there and then all of a sudden you start seeing scrapes and scratches from the beads of sand that have gone in as you've closed the legs in mm-hmm. and oh, yep. no i've taken i've taken more showers with my tripod than i care to admit yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know what it works it works it works it works yeah and I suppose, you know, and the, 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 the final regular segment that we have is our VSP. So it stands for a very solid product. It's the product that you put your name to it, if you could, but you won't leave home without it. So I imagine you both have your own VSP actually here. So maybe, you know, Chris, can I go to you first on what's your VSP? Yes. So what I never leave home without is my L brackets. Okay. I love that thing. Uh, I think it's a three-legged thing. The L-bracket. orange one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's just amazing. It changed the whole workflow of my photography, like being able to switch so quickly from vertical to horizontal is amazing. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love absolutely the same as that. I love the L, L bracket as well. It never comes off my camera. So I, it always comes with me by default. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, L bracket is a game changer. 100%. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, and it's the, so cheap, the, you know, if you compare it to other things in the yeah, photography. In year. photography. Yeah. yeah, like if you you put you put the name photography after something, and you can double <laughs> if not triple the price. You know, so yeah, exactly. Yeah, and Mike, what's yours? That's a great one, Chris. Thanks for that, Mike. What's mm-hmm. yours? So mine is, and depends on where you're from, what you call it. But mine's the Swiss Army knife. So okay. this is before I married a Swiss. You know, I, I've always been a fan <laughs> of their knives. But yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> it was written so, in the stars. <laughs> written in the stars, exactly. Because it has a little bit of everything, you know, screwdrivers and stuff, and then it has the pliers. Uh, to help get cactus out of your leg, which we get a lot here in Arizona. So that's a, it's a must have when you're hiking in the desert is one of those yeah. you know, pliers no to doubt. get the cactus because the cactus will find its way into your leg. I promise you. <laughs> well, I haven't had a Swiss Army knife as a VSP now in the past. So again, it's the second first now for this evening and particularly <laughs> right. to take the cactus out of your leg. But I can imagine that is horrible. Oh, it's right. yeah, it's definitely not fun. And a lot of times you'll find it weeks later in a sock somewhere that you didn't know you'll put the sock on oh. and you're like, why does that hurt so bad? And uh, oh. yeah, yeah. The, the Choya cactus here, they like to follow you home and uh, become your best friend for a while. Yeah, I've never, I, 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 I've never been to a desert, but I tell a lie, I have been to a desert. I've been to Vegas, but that's not a desert. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. Concrete desert. It's a concrete desert. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, so I've never been to a desert. It's something that I'd long to do. I'd long to go and take photographs of. Not, only, not the cactus, but it's just the whole yeah. aspect of the desert. You know what I mean? You got, it, the desert changes every day, and that's what fascinates me about it, because yes. the wind will change the flow, the contours, the, everything actually is in it. And I'm like, yeah, I got to do that that someday. So someday, mm-hmm. I promise, you know, 
Um, I've got a long list of areas that I want to go to, but someday I will, and I'll get over and I'll meet up with you guys, and you can take me to a desert. Perfect. Make sure you take me through the areas that don't have the cactus, right? Yes, um, you absolutely. Know, I mean, like I've got pale and white skin as well, so I won't have long time to go in that sunshine either. So yeah, we just go It'll to be Taco a short Bell. Trip. Yes, and no Taco Bell either. <laughs> no Taco Bell, no Taco Bell. Um, I suppose an- another question, actually, speaking of traveling. So you know, um, I know Mike, you haven't visited Ireland yet, have you, Chris? Have you ever been to Ireland? No, unfortunately not. Okay. So, has it something that you've thought about doing? Is it something that's on the list? Is it something that you've considered? Because, you know, there's a huge amount that awaits in Ireland. I know it's a small, tiny island, and I'm always going to be waxing lyrical about my country, (laughs) but Ireland is a little dot, but it's a dot that has so much. We don't have deserts. Fine. We don't have deserts. (laughs) We don't have rainforests. We've got forests and it rains a lot. So maybe you could actually say that it's a rainforest, but we've got quite a lot. So is there any plans for you guys to ever come and visit the Emerald Isle? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to do the the big waves, I believe, in September. You guys have the big waves over there? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That's something I'm definitely interested in for sure. Yeah. And how about you, Chris? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, I I had um, plans to visit Ireland in the last few years, you know, a few times. But then Mm -hmm. at the end, you know, you're not the only one that decides where (laughs) you're going to travel. So my friends, most of the time, they wanted to go to other places. But uh, Mm -hmm. it was definitely on the list to places of visit of places to visit. Yeah, well, look, you know what? When when all this shit storm is over, like I said, there will be an open invitation for you both to come to Ireland. I know Dermot wants you to come to Ireland as well because he wants yep. to. He promised you lots of things that he'd bring you along the, <laughs> uh, the, the west coast, and it is true. I mean, look, you know, the Ireland Ireland as as an area is so small, but the waves that we get, not just in September. September is great, um, mm-hmm. but you get some fantastic storms in January, February, and March, and oh, they've nice. had all this time to build up coming across this wide open expanse of the Atlantic, and all of a sudden they just meet this small little dot, oh, and man. they're ridiculous. I mean, it's like I've had some of my best ever photography trips in storms on the wild Atlantic. Um, We're in, awesome. yeah, yeah. It'll be it'll be great. Okay, absolutely. So, um. I suppose you got two more questions, guys. We're after flying oh, through this. It feels yeah, like okay. it anyway, yeah. So um, I suppose to, the final two questions is like, what's next for both of you? And where can people find more information on yourselves? What's next? Tacos, probably. Probably tacos <laughs> for dinner. That's probably next. But <laughs> No, we have, uh, like I said, a couple of workshops this uh, fall and summer. Other than that, it's going to be uh, trying to get back to normal and, you know, going out, filming YouTube videos and just trying to, to get the stride going again, you know, and trying to get mm-hmm. the ball rolling on, on everything. So yeah, I think that's all we, we don't have anything really planned. Um, other than that, just see, kind of playing it by ear and see what happens. Yeah. Fingers crossed. It all comes back to a bit of normality sooner rather than later anyway, but I'm sure look, you know, you guys in the USA do seem to be getting a bit, bit better, I suppose, and faster at things than we are here in Europe. So you know, you can mm-hmm. at least move around a bit more freely. And I think people mm-hmm. will yes. be open to that too, you know. So the, the only flip side that I'll say to you is, is that there's a huge pent up need and a pent up demand from people that when the restrictions and what everything else is gone, then there'll be a plethora of people that are going to be looking for services like that. So mm-hmm. yeah, it will be pushed down the line, but I know when it comes, it'll probably come in a flood. Like, so it'll be really, really good, you know. So yeah, hopefully that becomes sooner rather than later. And maybe Chris, maybe you can let the audience know where can they find more information on you both. Yes, we do have uh, the YouTube channel, which is Perea Photography. And then we both have uh, an Instagram account. Mine is Chris underscore underscore Perea. And then mine is Mike Perea Photography on Instagram and Facebook. Oh, yeah, Facebook, too. That's just my name. Yeah. <laughs> and then... Nobody cares about Facebook, though. Facebook's yeah. just... It is what it yeah. is. <laughs> it's about arguing yeah. with people on Facebook. That's all we do. <laughs> yes, that that is exactly what it is. Facebook is the home of the keyboard warriors. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, look, um, what I'll do is I, I'll I'll put links and stuff in here to both your socials and such like that, um, and websites and whichever and YouTube channels. I put it in the show notes and I'll put it up on the Facebook because I do have the group on Facebook where we have a closed group for our listeners here in Ireland. Mm-hmm. And I'll share stuff like that, and I'll also put it up on the Instagram as well. So. Um, guys, I have really, really enjoyed this conversation. I mean, it's gone quicker than I thought it's gone, to be honest with you. And I look and go, wow, geez, we've been talking for this length of time. Um, thank you very, very much for coming on, for sharing both of your stories. And, you know, 
I think that uh, that lion story is going to sit with me for a long, long, long time. <laughs> I think between now and whenever oh, I can Darren, get the scariness out of my head. Right. Uh, we really appreciate you having us, man. It's been a blast. Yeah, I know. Thanks a million, guys. And someday we will meet, if not over there, over here. But yeah, um, from me in Ireland to you guys in Arizona, thanks a million. And hopefully until the day we meet, it's long to fall. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey, guys. If you dig what you're hearing, why don't you jump over to iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Give us a five-star rating, and don't forget to share with your friends. With all that done, we'll see you next week. And remember, keep shooting.